Chapter Thirty of Wise and Otherwise. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wise and Otherwise by Pansy. Chapter Thirty. For vain man would be wise. Wilt thou take this man to be thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love and honor him, cherish and comfort him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others? keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? It was Mr. Tresevant's voice that sounded down the aisles of the Park Street Church, asking these old solemn questions. It was Del Bronson's voice, sweet, full, and clear, that answered him, I will. And the minister proceeded, After these vows thus solemnly made by you both, in the presence of God and these witnesses, I pronounce you husband and wife, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Brief and solemn was the prayer. Then the bride and groom, followed by their special friends, moved down the aisle, and the sea of heads on either side turned and looked after, and stretched their necks to get a glimpse of their new pastor and his new wife, Reverend and Mrs. Homer Nelson. The bridal party went directly to the home of Mr. Jerome Sales for the purpose of receiving their friends. Lookers-on from behind window-blinds said, as they watched the triumphal procession, it was very strange, if she had a home, that she didn't go to it to get married, instead of choosing a place where she hadn't a single relation, but they had always heard that she was odd. Dell had canvassed this question herself. Uncle Edward's dear home stood eagerly open for her, and she would have liked it just a little better to have gone out from that home in her bridal robes, but there were other considerations. She could count by the dozen, people, old and poor, and with few pleasures, who would never forget the joy of attending their pastor's wedding. There were certain members of her Sabbath school class, factory girls, who rarely kept holiday. Her wedding would be a marked era in their lives. And there was a certain bright-eyed little maiden, who would be in a perfect flutter of wondering delight over a bride in real lace and diamonds, and that was Jenny Adams. Dell decided to forego the pleasures of a Boston wedding, and accept the hospitalities of Mr. and Mrs. Jerome Sales. So Jenny Adams and Jim Forbes were among the invited guests at the reception. Mrs. Ainsley also was present, in a perfect bewilderment still as regarded her idea of things, calling the bride Delia at one moment, and apologizing in blushing confusion the next. Dell at one time was reminded forcibly of another wedding at which she had been a guest. She looked about her and counted those present who had been at that other wedding. There were the Winthrops of Boston and Mr. and Mrs. Tresevant. Only Mrs. Tresevant was the bride on that other evening, and Mr. Tresevant was not the groom. There also were Mr. Nelson and herself. With a little laugh at her own folly, she changed her position and took one opposite Mr. Nelson, as she remembered standing for a few moments that other evening. She remembered just how he looked then, and she was trying to trace the changes, when she heard Mr. Tresevant's voice near her. "'I don't remember,' he said. "'Perhaps Mrs. Nelson will recall it?' "'Mrs. Nelson! That was a new name. How unfamiliar it sounded. She looked about her in search of a Mrs. Nelson, while Mr. Tresevant asked his question and awaited his reply. Mr. Nelson came to the rescue, with grave voice but mischievous eyes. Mrs. Nelson, I think you cannot have understood Mr. Tresevant's question. And the bride turned with glowing face to her questioner. She had that very moment discovered who Mrs. Nelson was. Our new bride and groom did many things outside of the conventional groove in which such people are supposed to walk. Among others, they did not take a bridal tour. There were matters in his parish that seemed to claim Mr. Nelson's immediate attention. There was a special work that he wished to do before the season changed. Dell explained the matter in characteristic fashion to the wondering Mrs. Ainsley. The fact is, we are not ready to go a journey. There is nowhere in particular that we want to go just now, and we do particularly want to remain at home. I never could understand why people must rush off on the cars or steamboats just as soon as they are married. Sure enough, Mrs. Ainsley said, I don't know any good reason for it, only people always do it, and it seems rather strange not to. But you are queer, Delia. I always said so when you lived with me, you know, and since I have known so much more about you, I really think you are queerer than ever. It came to pass in the course of the following winter that the people of whom Dell expected to see very little she saw a great deal. 
Mrs. Tresevant fell into the habit of running to advise with Mrs. Nelson on all topics of interest. Life had opened in a new channel to that little woman. For the first time she began to take an interest in things outside of herself. She had opened her eyes, Mrs. Douglas said, and discovered that there were people in the world beside Mrs. Tresevant. They were very unlike still, these two ministers' wives. Mrs. Tresevant was dollish and kittenish, and whatever expresses the idea of childishness yet, and would probably always remain so. Religion does not change our natures, it only tones them. Mrs. Tresevant leaned, and always would lean, on Mrs. Nelson. The stronger nature asserted itself. The beauty of it was that she chose just that person to cling to instead of some unsafe prop. Meanwhile, life still went hard with Mr. Tresevant, all the harder because he looked upon Mr. Nelson as a powerful rival, whose influence he resented, instead of accepting him as a co-worker. Moreover, this poor man was dissatisfied with himself, utterly and entirely, and when a man arrives at that state, and yet makes no effort, and indeed has no desire to get into a better condition of heart and life, he is to be pitied. Perhaps that is hardly fair. He did indeed desire a change, but that desire was not strong enough to make him willing to admit himself in the wrong. "'How will it all end?' Mrs. Douglas asked, in a half-petulant, half-hopeless tone, after she had been recounting one of Mr. Tresevant's deeds that seemed more than usually absurd. Her husband answered her reverently, "'God knows.' "'I, God knew. The winter Sabbath morning was very bleak and blustering. Comparatively few people were abroad. The church bells were tolling dismally, as if they had not much hope of coaxing people to come out in the snow and sleet. Up in Mr. Tresevant's parlor an anxious group were assembled. Dell and her husband were over by the window, conversing in undertone. Mr. Tresevant paced the floor, making vain efforts to seem self-controlled and at ease. In a low chair near the fire the pale little mother sat holding a very snowflake of a baby in her arms. You needed only to glance at the limp form and heavy eyes of the wee darling to understand why there was such a look of terror on the mother's face, and why Dr. Douglas stood so sadly looking down on them both. Mrs. Tresevant suddenly broke the stillness. "'Oh, Carol, don't go to church today. Everybody will excuse you. Don't leave us, Carol.' "'Of course you will be excused,' Dell said impulsively. It would have been better if she had kept quiet. Her voice seemed to annoy Mr. Tresevant. "'Nonsense,' he said impatiently. "'Why should I not go to church? I don't belong to the privileged class, who may stay at home on account of the weather.' Dr. Douglas caught an imploring glance from the poor mother's eyes, and turned toward her husband. He was used at such times to having people hang on his lightest word, so he said briefly, "'I think you will be justified in remaining at home, Mr. Tresevant.' Mr. Tresevant was exceedingly annoyed. Had they decided to do with him whatever they would? He answered haughtily, "'Of course my own conscience must be my justifier in the matter. I shall preach as usual.' "'Oh, Carol, what if—if if you should never see our little darling again?' It was his wife's pitiful tones that murmured this appeal. The father's face paled visibly, but he answered in irritation, "'Laura, don't be so childish. The baby is better, his breathing is easier, and I don't feel in the least alarmed at the result. You have worked yourself into a very nervous state.' Not a word said Dr. Douglas, nor did he move his watchful eyes from the sweet baby face." A close observer would have drawn no crumb of comfort from the look on that doctor's face. Mr. Nelson made one more effort. As he drew on his gloves preparatory to leaving, his wife had spent the night with Mrs. Tresevant in the sick room and had decided to remain with her, he crossed over to Mr. Tresevant's side and spoke in low tones. If you want to send a message, Brother Tresevant, you know I pass your church and shall be very glad to serve you. There is plenty of time. Thank you, said Mr. Tresevant. I will walk with you as far as my church. It is nearly time for service. It was in the midst of Mr. Tresevant's sermon, which was a peculiarly eloquent one, that one of the officers of the church walked up the aisle with that peculiar movement and look which betokened a message so important that all embarrassment at delivering it at such a time was lost. The wondering clergyman paused as his parishioner ascended the pulpit steps, half a dozen whispered words, and Mr. Tresevant grew as pale as the marble flower-stand whereon his hand rested. 
he staggered backward a step, then suddenly turned and went swiftly and silently down the steps, down the aisle, out the door. It was Judge Benson who had been the messenger. His voice trembled visibly as he spoke to the waiting congregation. My friends, word has come to our pastor that the angel of death is hovering around his threshold, waiting for his only son. Let us pray. It was a very quiet room into which Mr. Tresevant presently burst. His wife was sitting in very nearly the position in which he had left her, their baby in her lap. Dr. Douglas knelt in front of her, his finger feeling carefully on the limp, damp wrist for the fluttering pulse. Mrs. Nelson stood a little apart, near enough to be ready for instant service, should service be required, far enough not to seem to be a watcher of the voiceless agony in the mother's face. There was no quietness about Mr. Tresevant's entrance, nor in his manner. He was nearly wild with excitement and anguish. He had more than half believed his own words in the morning, and had gone away persuaded in his own mind that his child was better. It was evident now to the most unskilled eye that death had set his seal on the beautiful baby face, but Mr. Tresevant would not believe it yet. He rung the bell furiously. He sent an imperative message after Dr. Thomas. He declared there had been nothing done for the child, that they were sitting stupidly by and letting him die. Dr. Thomas came and spoke that most hateful of all hateful sentences in the chamber of death. It was too late to do anything. If he had been called before, he might have been of service. Dr. Thomas enjoyed this sentence. It was rarely that he had opportunity to say anything in the presence of Dr. Douglas. People who had confidence in the one were apt to ignore the other. Dr. Douglas set his lips a little more firmly, and schooled himself to endure in utter silence, while he continued his ministrations to the dying child. Dr. Thomas talked in his loudest professional tone on the cause and effect of disease, and the utter absurdity of allowing people to die. Nobody listened to him, but that seemed to make no difference. In the midst of his harangue, Mrs. Tresevant summoned her husband to her side. "'Carol, won't you send him away? It is of no use. Dr. Douglas has done everything, everything, but baby is going. God has called him, he is going fast. And won't you send that man away? See, his voice disturbs my darling.' Mr. Tresevant went slowly over to the doctor's side. It had been easier to send for him than it was to dismiss him. He went, pondering what words he should say. He was already sorry for his hasty summons. There was no time for words to him. Mrs. Tresevant spoke sharply. Carol, oh, Carol, come quick. He wants to kiss you. Oh, my darling, my blessed little darling. The father turned quickly, but in that brief space the precious opportunity was gone. The sweet baby lips settled into the beautiful solemn stillness of death. The bright eyes were closed. Baby's last kiss lingered fresh on his mother's lips, but the poor father missed even this consolation. End of chapter 30 Recording by Tricia G.